Coming up, a serious health threat on a Pennsylvania college campus. Find out how Penn State is reacting to make sure it doesn't spread here. Plus, what the legalization of hemp across the country means for some farmers in our area. And a new push in the battle over public and private school sports playoffs. I think it's kind of unfair for our players to be expected to go out here with the homegrown kids and compete against kids that are kind of put together strategically. The Center County Report starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Maddie Beer Temple. And I'm Tyler Olson, thanks for joining us. Penn State University health officials are keeping a close eye on a serious outbreak of mumps at another Pennsylvania college campus. More than 100 cases are now confirmed at Temple University in Philadelphia. Reporter Haley Brown looks at the risk here in our area. More than 2,000 students and employees at Temple University lined up this week for free vaccines on campus as the number of confirmed and probable mumps cases hit 106. Mumps is caused by a virus and spread through coughing and sneezing and saliva. Most cases happen in children and teens who spread it at schools and dorms. Penn State College of Medicine pediatrician Dr. Deepa Sakur says the symptoms may be hard to spot at first. So you might have a low-grade fever, you might not feel like eating so much, might set some headache, body aches. The big thing that you see with mumps is swelling of your salivary glands, but this doesn't usually appear till a few days in. Some people never show symptoms, but mumps can lead to other health complications and it can spread quickly. Most people who have the mumps are contagious from a couple days before that salivary gland swelling starts to, they typically say, five days afterwards. Along with the Temple mumps cases, one University of Pennsylvania student was also diagnosed with the mumps. So far, Penn State hasn't had any mumps cases, but here at University Health Services, they're watching the developments in Philadelphia closely. Penn State Infectious Disease Manager and Campus Health Liaison Shelley Hafner shares some tips on how students and faculty can try and stay healthy during an outbreak. First thing, make sure you're up to date on your immunizations. Make sure you've had two doses of MMR. Another is that is don't share food and drinks with anybody at any point in time right now because it's just too risky. The Centers of Disease Control says the MMR vaccine is the best protection against mumps. In University Park, I'm Haley Brown for the Center County Report. Penn State confirmed at least a dozen mumps cases last spring at University Park. Plans are moving ahead for a $14 million renovation project at Memorial Field in State College, home to state high football and other sports. Reporter Lila Cook is live at the field downtown with the latest information. Lila? Thanks, Maddie. The school board of directors met on Tuesday and approved over $11 million in construction bids. But the approved plan for Memorial Field means students won't be able to use it for quite some time. The total cost of the renovation project is more than $14 million. The project will start in May of this year and won't be finished until August 2020. This means athletic teams will have to play at Northfield. But the board is still considering a hybrid calendar that would allow Memorial Field to be open for about three weeks this October for popular football games such as the homecoming and senior night game. Completion under the hybrid plan would still be at the same date of August 2020, but the board will have to vote on that next month. Live in State College, I'm Lila Cook for the Center County Report. Thanks, Lila. A proposed change to the PIAA high school sports playoff system might be coming soon, and it could have an effect on how well your local school does in postseason play. Cooper Deck reports. The first step toward a big change may be coming to Pennsylvania high school sports. The issue is a hotly debated topic. Should public and private schools have separate playoff systems? At Bald Eagle Area High School in Wingate, Ryan Watkins says he's experienced what he believes is an unfair disadvantage as both a player and later a coach going up against private schools. I think it's kind of unfair for our players to be expected to go out here with the homegrown kids and compete against kids that are kind of put together strategically. 
The current system splits schools into six categories based on size, but does not split up public versus private schools. Critics argue that allows private, many of them Catholic, and charter school teams to essentially recruit athletes from anywhere, while public schools are restricted to their geographic boundaries. They had 20 guys that they, that they wanted and that they pretty much groomed and chose, rather than the 20 guys that just grew up in the area. Bald Eagle's district is physically large, but its student enrollment is less than 1,000. Just to the south is the State College School District, with more than 2,200 students at the high school. But like Bald Eagle, State High is limited to its boundaries when it comes to student athletes. You have one school that can have a broader uh, geographic boundary for where they're able to pull athletes, and athletes are able to come and families are able to participate in their schools and you other, have other districts that are restricted to their community. Um, that obviously is imbalanced. Many coaches and fans say the proof is in the numbers. Over the last 10 years, the number of private school championships in the PIAA has increased in Pennsylvania, with boys basketball up from 5 to 29 percent, football from 13 to 50 percent, and girls volleyball up from 12 to 46 percent. The issue led public school administrators to hold a conference last summer and push for changes. Many of the public school officials said they're going to walk away from the PIAA if something wasn't done. Tor Michaels is the chief of staff for State Representative Scott Conklin of Center County. Conklin has introduced a bill that would give the PIAA the option to separate playoffs for boundary and non-boundary schools. The bill would need to make it through the legislator and the governor, but if it does... The, the folks that are on the front line will now be able to sit down with the PIAA and say, okay, let's come up with something that is fairer for all. This would be a big change in Pennsylvania high school athletics. But Bald Eagle Area School District Athletic Director Doug Dyke says it's not unprecedented. I hope that people, again, look at other states and realize they're not really asking for something new. The same battle is ongoing in states like Tennessee, Georgia, Louisiana, and Florida. Texas separated playoffs across all sports. Michaels is confident about the possibilities in Pennsylvania. I have never witnessed a more overwhelming positive response statewide to any other initiative. I repeatedly asked to interview athletic directors of Catholic schools across Pennsylvania, including St. Joseph's Catholic Academy here in Center County. I also reached out to the Diocese of Altoona, Johnstown, and Philadelphia, but no one would comment. The PIAA has not taken a side in this legislation but did release a statement saying, recently, the board of directors adopted numerous important policies that will increase competitive fairness, hold schools accountable, and provide safer playing environments for student athletes. They later went on to say that these new transfer policies have already been implemented and will go into effect during the 2020-2021 seasons. In State College, I'm Cooper Deck for the Center County Report. Legislator Scott Conklin says he would like to see these new proposed changes put in before the next school year. The parents of a 29-year-old black man who was shot and killed by State College Police last week have hired lawyers and say they want answers. Police were called to Osazi Osagi's apartment to serve a mental health warrant. State College attorneys Kathleen Yurchik and Andrew Shubin will represent the family as they search for answers in the shooting. Osagi allegedly came at police with a knife, and that's when they fired. Drivers may see an uptick in traffic congestion on Interstate 99 in Center County with a new 13-mile project now underway. The work zone starts at mile mar marker 56 at the Blair Center County line and extends to mile marker 69 near State College. The project will focus on concrete patching along with cleaning and sealing of the pavement. Drivers can expect lane closures at times, mainly during daytime hours. The project should be finished by late June. A Canadian cannabis business just bought Pennsylvania-based hemp company Agronext USA. It's part of the company's plan to build up its hemp business across the U.S. and our state. Federal legalization of hemp arrived in the U.S. last year, and the industry is booming. Reporter Caroline Pimentel has more on what it could mean for local farmers. Carve Grove 
is a Center County farmer who will be cultivating industrial hemp for the first time this growing season in spring mill. Hemp is just an awesome renewable resource. There's like 25,000 different products they're making from hemp. So it's just, it's going to be a good, a good crop. A compound in hemp known as CBD is a skyrocketing in popularity because many see it as a health aid. Ham looks and it smells like marijuana, but contains almost no THC, which is what causes the high for pot users. The hemp plant has less than 0.3% THC, uh, which is the element that can get you high, the psychoactive ingredient that's in marijuana. Farmers say ham seeds can help not only humans, but also environment. The fact that it's good for the, the environment, good for the people, it saves trees. There's a lot of different variables that went into the idea of growing hemp. This is an empty field for now. In May, June, this land will be filled up with 152 acres of industrial hemp plants. Growing hemp is legal on the federal level now, although requirements to get a permit includes an FBI background check and a list of street addresses with a single GPS coordinate for each farm location where the ham will be grown. In 2018, there were already 40 industrial ham research or growing permit holders in Pennsylvania. The State Department of Agriculture also sees promise in this booming industry. And we have a lot of hope for hemp uh, as a sustainable product that farmers can grow. And by sustainable, I mean a sustainable source of income. In Spring Mills, I'm Caroline Pimentel reporting for Santa County Report. The Canadian cannabis company, Canopy Growth Corporation, is planning to build a series of industrial hemp parks across the country, including Pennsylvania, as part of its expansion plan. There might be a little rain this weekend, but it's going to feel like spring. Patrick has the seven-day forecast. Plus, the issues and the candidates in an upcoming special election for Congress. Also coming up 40 years after Three Mile Island, the legacy the accident left behind, including in Penn State's nuclear engineering department. It's spring at Harper's in downtown State College, your source for unique fashion for the gentleman who appreciates quality and style, from the classics to the contemporary styles. To keep you looking great this spring and all year long, the only choice is Harper's downtown State College. Harper's is where you'll find all the best spring fashions for her. Our women's boutique is full of special finds, unique accessories, and classic and contemporary fashions from top designers. Experience Harper's Spring Collection, a downtown State College tradition for over 90 years. This week marks the 40th anniversary of the Three Mile Island nuclear accident near Harrisburg. But four decades after the scare, nuclear power is still important in Pennsylvania. Penn State even plans to expand its nuclear engineering department as more students pursue the career path. This week marks 40 years since Three Mile Island's partial nuclear meltdown near Harrisburg. Not only did the incident damage public perception of nuclear energy, following it, fewer students were enrolling in nuclear engineering programs nationwide. Penn State was no exception. Our junior class was seven. The funding for nuclear energy was Zero. Arthur Mata chairs Penn State's nuclear engineering department, where he's worked for 25 years. He says the program is making a comeback. 45, 47 juniors in nuclear engineering, the class is. Uh, there's over $43 million in funding. In July, the university will make nuclear engineering its own department and nearly double its faculty from 8 to 15, thanks to an endowment. Nuclear energy research has been part of the university since 1955 when Penn State first started operating its Brazil reactor. Today it's one of few universities in the country that still has a research reactor on campus. Despite poor public perception of nuclear energy following events like Three Mile Island, Mata says it's a safe and clean form of energy. If we close down nuclear power plants, our goals for having clean energy, that is energy production without the emission of greenhouse gases, will be severely affected. Many students, like PhD candidate Pierre Clement Simon, say nuclear energy is important in combating climate change. It creates little waste and no carbon emissions. There's so many ways uh, uh, and to appreciate nuclear energy that I hope we're going to get to that point where nuclear energy is more widely accepted. 
Many Americans are still split on the issue, stemming from concerns about storing spent fuel and accidents that could release radiation. A 2019 Gallup poll found 49 percent supported nuclear power in the U.S., up from about 44 percent in 2016. In 2016, Penn State awarded 90 bachelor's degrees in nuclear engineering, more than any other university that year, according to the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education. Just under two months before voters head to the polls, the special election in Pennsylvania's 12th congressional district is generating national attention. Here's how each candidate says he'll represent our area in the House. The only way that we're going to get this done is if we work together. We are going to need help from everybody in this room. The 12th Congressional District special election is now 53 days away, and the campaign between Democrat Mark Friedenberg and Republican Fred Keller is in full swing. Keller just announced a round of endorsements from 24 county commissioners in the district. Meanwhile, Friedenberg opened offices in Williamsport and Lamont this week and received a Twitter shout-out from Chelsea Handler. As the candidates crisscross North Central Pennsylvania in a sprint to the May 21st finish line, they're laying out their visions for how they'd represent the 12th district. Keller is running as a conservative, which fits the mold of the deep red 12th district. He says the government generally shouldn't have a big role in people's lives. The people should be defining what our government is, not having our government define us with big government programs. Keller's for increased border security, prescription monitoring for opioids, and supports President Donald Trump's stances on Israel. He also wants work requirements for entitlements, voted to make Pennsylvania a right-to-work state, and believes life begins at conception. He also doesn't support the Green New Deal. Well, certainly that does not help us when we're trying to fight Russia and some of these people who do not share American interests. Friedenberg is pro-choice and supports a $15 minimum wage. He's also for Medicare for All and the Green New Deal like many House freshmen, but doesn't endorse democratic socialism like some do. The market, capitalism, is the greatest possible engine that we can have for economic growth, and it's made us the global powerhouse that we are. But there are cases where it fails. Friedenberg says he's concerned about the national debt and says increased taxes like those in the 1950s and 60s can control deficits and fund programs like Medicare for All. Uh, I think we need to have a, a system where the wealthiest and corporations are paying their fair share. They've taken over the political system. They've bought most politicians. He's also active on women's issues and is a supporter of the State College Women's March, where he made his first public appearance as a candidate in the special election. The voter registration deadline for the May 21st primaries and special election is April 22nd. Well, I'm afraid to say the clouds are hanging around State College today and at least for the next couple hours into tomorrow, too. But first, well, yeah, Beaver Stadium shrouded in the clouds right now. Temperatures around the region, 52 here in State College, 55 down in Altoona. We have that southerly wind warming us up in the southern portion of the state. Further, in the no further north you go, 48 degrees in Bradford and 41 over in Erie. You have that northerly wind cooling things down just a little bit. Philadelphia being the warm spot on the map at 57 degrees. Now, in terms of our satellite and radar, well, we do have some showers in the area quickly moving on out, and those will decrease as we head into the rest of the day. We're mainly a few showers left over by 3 o'clock, mainly concentrated further towards the north in the Bradford area. But in terms of our rest of the future weather, we do dry out nicely by this evening, but the clouds will remain 7.30 a.m. on Saturday. A few showers moving back in, but the clouds will remain throughout the day tomorrow. Just ahead of a cold front, temperatures will warm up, though. In terms of our forecast for tonight, 59 degrees here in State College, so it's going to look nice if I can get my standing on the green screen. 59 degrees for a high gloom, a doom and gloom this afternoon, but then by tomorrow this evening, 47 for a low. And then the seven day forecast. Hey, look at this. The sun will come back, but we do get to 65 on Sunday on Saturday, but we cool off with that cold front moving through, but drying out and clearing out by the middle of next week. So temperatures are looking good though. It's like kind of climb back into the up, mid to upper 50s. Yeah, sunshine in Pennsylvania. What a novel concept. <laughs> I know, we get to enjoy it for a little bit. Here's Hannah Mears with sports. We'll check in with Penn State football as spring practice continues. Plus the shot at Olympic gold in 2020 will begin in State College for some athletes. Also coming up, the defending District 6 champs are ready to defend their high school baseball title this season. We'll see how the season started this week.
I'm Hannah Mears with sports. A basic blue sky was the backdrop for the first outdoor football practice of spring camp this week. The Nittany Lions completed another practice getting ready for the blue-white game. After losing some senior leaders, there's been some concern about who can set the example for younger players on the team. Now a veteran on the team, KJ Hamler, says he leads by example and is ready to help out whenever needed. I can play faster. Um, you know, I can help out the younger guys if they need help. They ask me questions within the play. So um, I think I can play that role as the, as a, as the top leader in the, in the receiving room. The Nittany Lions have two more weeks of practice before the blue-white game on April 13th. Penn State baseball is in Indiana today as they take on Purdue in a three-game weekend series. The Nittany Lions are coming off a win this week against Binghamton. But before that, they lost three straight Big Ten games against Minnesota at Medler Field. When it comes to conference play, Coach Rob Cooper wants his team to stay focused and consistent, but knows the challenges ahead. It, it's a challenge, right? You get to go play a, a team at their place that was in the NCAA tournament last year. Um, and, you know, you want to, the guys want to get on the board in the, in the conference in the win column. And... The Nittany Lions are currently 14-6, and, and today's game in West Lafayette starts at 4 o'clock p.m. On the high school level, the State College Little Lions are trying to make some noise again on the baseball field. The defending District 6 champs have a new head coach this year, Jeremy Dinsmore. The team began the season with two games this week. On Tuesday, the Little Lions lost at home to Redland 8-2, but bounced back the next day on the road to beat Chambersburg 7-4. Coach Dinsmore is hopeful for repeat success again this year. We're going to look to continue the success that we've had, uh, go three-peat three this year for the district title. Uh, won it the past two years. It's something that these boys you know, love to go out there and compete and at the highest level, and it's something that's on the radar to continue to get into the state playoffs. The Little Lions' next game is Tuesday at home against Cumberland Valley. Penn State Wrestling brought home its eighth national title in nine years, along with three individual champions over the weekend. Two of those champions were senior phenoms Bo Nickel and Jason Nolf. But don't worry, the two seniors should be back competing in State College in the near future. The 2020 Olympic trials will be held at the Bryce Jordan Center next year. Nolf, Nickel, and a few of their teammates will compete in hopes of joining the team that will represent the United States in Tokyo. The trials will most likely take place in April, four months before the Olympics. That's all I have for sports. Now back to you at the Anchor Desk. Thanks, Anna. Coming up next, a local food pantry is working to make sure students don't go hungry, and it's taking donations in a unique way. Stay with us for that story. We may not think about it much, but some people in central PA don't have enough food to eat, including some Penn State students. The Lions Pantry is trying to help. This week it held an event to make a difference. Reporter Olivia Cataldo explains. Food insecurity is a major problem on college campuses nationwide. This means that many students do not have reliable access to enough nutritious foods. In 2014, the Lions Pantry was created to help provide food for Penn State students who are experiencing food insecurity. One way the Lions Pantry brings awareness to this issue is through their event, Canstruction. Tiana Williams, president of the Lions Pantry, believes this event positively impacts students. I think the overall goal is to make people aware of food insecurity by being here as like an organization and showing like what we do and knowing that students have this as a resource but also it's a creative way for different organizations to collaborate on an issue that is felt so strongly among all of us. Different organizations partook in this event, building structures entirely out of cans. All of the cans will then be donated to the Lions Pantry. Benjamin Lyman, who participated in Canstruction, thinks it is important to bring together other organizations in order to create a bigger impact. Together we wanted to unite the worlds of sustainability and um, poverty and hunger to try and raise awareness for both because we think they're both um, cohesive issues and they don't get a lot of attention. So we wanted to bring people from the sustainability world, which we're more familiar with, into food insecurity and try to um, make them more aware of that. Each can structure was then judged based on design, structural ingenuity, best meal and use of labels. This competition showcased a unique opportunity to educate and provide critical food resources to the community. We're like 
holding hands with the students that we go to class with, that we work with, that we see every day, that we might not even know are dealing with these issues. Can instruction address the prevalence of hunger at Penn State and the resources they have to combat it? In University Park, I'm Olivia Cataldo for the Center County Report. All Penn State students with a current ID are eligible to use the Lions Pantry. It's located on the University Park campus at Services Road in between Lions Surplus and the Blue Beyond Building. That's all for today's newscast. You can find more of our stories on our website, centercountyreport.com. And you can follow us anytime for breaking news on our Twitter feed. That's at Center County REP or on our Facebook page. We also have a Center County Report Instagram. Join us for our next newscast next Friday. Have a great weekend.